Good evening, folks, and welcome to Irish Media Network Sports Update. I'm your host, Joe Caulfield, and welcome to the show. Now, before I go any further, the big news in sport tonight is that the Irish soccer team travelled to Wembley Stadium to take on England in a friendly match this evening. I mean, is it really ever friendly when Ireland take on the old enemy? I certainly hope not, because Stephen Kenny's charges have yet to score a win under his tutelage, but also have yet to score a goal in the last four games they've played. So all eyes will be on Wembley Stadium at 8 o'clock tonight to see can they book that trend and score a famous victory. Let's move on, though, and talk about the Autumn Nations Cup kicking off tomorrow with Ireland versus Wales. And joining me to do so is the creator of the Loose Head podcast, Jeff Neville. Jeff, how are things? Not so bad. How's life? Things are good, man. Looking forward to tomorrow evening, are you? Yeah, it's gonna. It's a good weekend of sport overall now. Um, actually, one of the lads actually sent on a message there into the group text and it had everything covered from the Masters to the Hurling to the rugby to the soccer tonight. Like, it's some weekend. We were starved for so long and now yeah. it's like a feast after the famine. It's unreal. That's it, and we're gluttonous. Absolutely, absolutely. There'll be um, ass grooves in the couches all over Ireland. <laughs> let's just sit and watch the sport all weekend. The Autumn Nations Cup is a great opportunity for Andy Farrell and the Irish team to kind of do a bit of experimentation. And I want to kick off by asking you, one of the things that he's obviously trying out at the moment is Jacob Stockdale at full back. I'd like your opinion on it. How long do you think he's going to try this out for? And do you feel it's been successful? I think it will be successful. I don't think it's borne the fruits of its labor yet. And it's funny you should use the word experiment. Like, you know, an experiment is defined as a procedure undertaken to test a hypothesis, you know, to see what will happen if we Mm. do something. And I don't think the elite level of the game is somewhere to, you know, to to create or conduct an experiment. Mm. To, To put Stockdale back at 15, I mean, I had a little look there earlier today at our back three options since um, since the England game. And if you look at the back three, you have Conway, you have Daly, who's more or less a 15, um, not a winger. You have Earls, Keane and Larmer, who's injured Stockdale. And now Lowe is coming into the mix now as well. And those seven guys are all the guys that have played um, between this year's Six Nations. Now, I know Larmer is injured. Conway can play 15. You know, that's an option. And Daly hasn't... Um, played yet but I mean Earl's coming back from injury they're your options you know to to put in 15 if you take out Stockdale I mean who are you going to put in and I was having a discussion with one of the lads the last day and it kind of made me laugh he was crying out for change in the Irish team he's like we have to change things we have to change this we have to change that and I said sure we're changing 15 he says ah but sure that's different and I, I don't see how that's different you know um you've you've people crying out for change Yes, when they're given change and it, it doesn't work immediately, they, say, they kind of disband it and they say, oh, it's, you know, it's not worth it. But it kind of, the Stockdale incident kind of reminds me of a case of trying to get your best 15 onto the pitch. And that includes Stockdale. You go back a couple of years ago, seven tries in a Six Nations tournament and people treated him like he was the second coming. And rightfully so, you know, he had a great tournament. But well, people now think he's useless, but that that's not how... That's not how sport works. Like on a couple of bad games does not a poor player make. And while he did make mistakes the last day, like let's say, for example, if we take the knock going down on the ball, let's say for uh, one of the French tries, mm-hmm. he could have made that mistake from the wing. You know, he could have been in the center. Like the mistake wasn't a positional one, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, but can I just jump in? Because I would agree with you and disagree with you in equal measure. I, I completely agree that Jacob Stockdale in 2018 could do no wrong in most facets of the game. He scored more tries than was ever scored in a Six Nations season. He couldn't not gather the ball when he chipped on. But I always felt the one deficiency he had, the one weakness in his game, was his defensive positioning. That it happened on occasion, he wasn't where he should have been when he should have been there. And on the wing, you get away with that far more than you do at full back. I mean, if your weakness is defensive positioning, then playing full back to position where defensive positioning, good defensive positioning is most required, surely that vulnerability is more likely to be exploited at 15 than it is 11. But I think he won't get to, to, let's say, that positional ability or that knowledge, I suppose, comes with experience. And it kind of, it's almost like you go for a job interview and they say you need two years experience to get the job, but you can't get the job because you don't have the experience. I mean, when when Carney was selected at 15, you had people crying out that he shouldn't be there. 
and they suddenly got their change and they're crying out saying, oh, he shouldn't be there. But I mean, Kearney took that jersey for so, so long. Larmer's out injured at the moment that you have no 15 with international experience at the moment. So, I mean, you can put in whoever you like. They're still probably going to make mistakes. And will their mistakes be treated with the same contempt that Stockdale's has been treated as over the last couple of months or last couple of weeks? I don't think so. Mm. And you look at, let's say, Bowden Barrett. I mean, Bowden Barrett and I... You know, I'm, I'm sure people's eyebrows now have raised a little bit here, but, you know, you look at Bowden Bard, World Player of the Year twice, and he had to make way from 10 to make way for Richie Mwonga. They moved him to 15. He's mm-hmm. not the best 15 in the world either, but he doesn't get slated. Well, I, I don't know, maybe he does in New Zealand, but from what I've seen, I've never seen him get slated so much in comparison to Jacob Stockdale, but it's a, it's a, it's a thing of having to move him to 15 to put Mwonga at 10 to make sure you have your best players on the pitch. Like, yeah, mistakes I understand. Mistakes will happen. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely get the point that you mean there. You want your best 15 on the pitch. In terms of general style of play, obviously, he's brought in some new players. He's obviously trying different players in different positions. But are there fundamental changes that Andy Farrell need to implement to Ireland's approach to how they play rugby to enable us to compete at the top table again? Or am I overreacting and thinking that there's just been such a fall off since the Joe Schmidt era. The drastic changes are, are needed to compete at the top table again. Well, like 2018, I think we were de facto the best team in the world. Won a Grand Slam, Leinster won all round them in terms of Europe. Won a tour down in Australia, beat New Zealand at home. Best team in the world for me. Fair, fair. But I don't think if I you think... were to play Ireland against New Zealand, England, or South Africa they would be within 10 points of any of those teams. I think to say to be competitive again, we are competitive. Like Wales were Grand Slam champions last year. They thumped us over in Cardiff. We beat Wales this year. We're looking ahead to Friday night again. I'd be confident of a good win there. Well, not a good win, but certainly a win. Like that's competitive, you know? Um, If you ask yourself, you you mentioned there New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, or um, England. If we Mm. played Australia, how would you rank us? How would you rank our chances? But then if you'd say, oh, we'd have an OK chance of beating Australia, like, I mean, Australia beat New Zealand, drew with New Zealand and lost twice in the last four games, you know. So, I mean, if we're capable of beating Australia, who beat New Zealand last week, I think we are competitive. And like Farrell, it's his fifth game or he has five games done. He's going into his sixth game. It takes time to bed in what you want to do. I mean, you look at Rob Penny with Munster there many years ago, and he had this idea of playing that, you know, the two or the the two four two idea or the, you know, just a wide expansive game, and it didn't go down well. But he was almost, I suppose, too ahead of his time. Um, what he was trying to implement there, people didn't like it. It took time to implement, and uh, unfortunately, what do you feel? Sorry, sorry to jump in, but what do you feel? Farrell's game plan is like what do you think he is trying to implement and again I'm not being critical I'm just trying to ascertain what's the style you feel would be most successful for him to try to develop within that Ireland squad I think he'll try to implement what Schmidt had this controlled game of almost I don't want to say choke the the opposition to death through control and through discipline but certainly playing a structured game where everything is you're almost like a sleeping giant you're just waiting for your opportunity to strike and you're happy to control the game up to then um for myself i think we as a team don't have perhaps the same ball carriers that the likes of england or new zealand have and i was thinking about this earlier uh when i was when i was chatting to you earlier today for me one of the best ball carriers in the world is ardy savia and the other one is billy von apola mm. uh, i pick savia because of when he carries the ball like he bounces off fellas. He doesn't just carry the ball. Like he, he, the energy, he, the explosiveness he has, the energy he yeah. brings, he just, he bounces off fellas. And then you look at Vunapola, he almost has his own gravitational pull. Um, fellas just want to, to, to come towards him because they think, okay, he's going to get the ball now. And even if he doesn't get the ball, whether he carries or not, he's still creating space because fellas are drawn to him. And I think we have maybe James Ryan certainly. Keen Healy or Dave Kilcoyne, you know, they're brilliant on the ball. Caelan Doris, Stander. I think after that, you're kind of looking at guys who will carry the ball, but not with the same, I suppose, gravitas as the two boys aforementioned. So I think we're kind of lacking maybe there. 
I think when you look at the centre partnership, you know, um, the likes of Henshaw and Farrell, um, Farrell's such a good footballer, um, carries ball so well, but he's also so skillful and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, big ball carriers means better collisions. It means better ruck speed. It means you're reorganising faster than the defence. So I think it comes down not to anything too drastic. I think it's just kind of fundamentals. Mm. It'll be very interesting to see because you're right. And like to say in 2018, to kind of go back to that, as I say, golden year, like they had that. They had particularly Dan Levy. He was such an explosive ball carrier. He could create that space that gives you a platform where the defence is trying to regroup and you have that extra second or two to form and to get in behind them or to move it quickly or do whatever that we, maybe we've been lacking. I, I'm really looking forward to the Autumn Nations Cup because I feel that it's an opportunity for Farrell to find out who his best 22 are and what the best game plan to suit them will be. But one thing that I see, I think that he needs to like think about for the future and also maybe uh, address the moment is, is Johnny Sexton, a captain, at out half and captain, like, I thought he was playing really well against France. I didn't think he deserved to be brought off. But when he was, I thought his behaviour coming off was unbefitting of a captain through a straw. If you're Andy Farrell, how do you react to that initially? And then what's your plan for replacing him in a year or two's time? Well, there's two questions there. I suppose, what do I do if I'm Andy Farrell? And my answer is, I'll have a chat with Johnny, like, and that's it. Um, in terms of Johnny throwing a strap, I think... I think if we've all had bad days at work where we've complained to a co-worker about something, you know, and, um, you know, you might be in a cafe, you might be chatting to a co-worker and maybe ranting about someone that you work with, you know, or something that happened in work. And we've all had days like that. Do you go up to the, you know, the server? Or do you turn to the table beside you and apologize for, for ranting to your co-worker, you know, or for having a moment? You don't, you know, and the only, I think the only difference is between, um, Johnny Sexton coming off that pitch and us having a rant with a co-worker in a cafe is that millions were watching him and nobody was watching us, you know. Um, I think it's important for people to remember that, yeah, there is conduct as a captain and stuff, but if we won that game by seven points, he is a Six Nations medal. He's won a Six Nations championship. He's not, it's to us, we tune in in time for the game or maybe in time for the analysis beforehand. It's two hours of our week, but it's been his whole month. You know, and it's been his whole, you know, since, well, in this case, it's been since February, you know, for him. And it's even all the sacrifices and all the training he's done. Coming into that game, you know, like he's heading into his 100 cap this weekend, his 100 international cap this weekend. Yet people are talking and like, you know, he shouldn't be captain or he shouldn't be playing for Ireland. Rather than, you know, celebrating what he's done, what he's accomplished. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that he couldn't have composed himself better coming off the pitch. Like, I understand where people say, oh, he's captain, he shouldn't act like that. But at the same time, he's human and he's poured himself into trying to accomplish something that probably wasn't coming off, that he still believed that he could turn things around. And suddenly mm -hmm. that, op that opportunity to do that is being taken away from you after mm -hmm. what was kind of a bad day at the office. Like, mm -hmm. you cannot, he, and not to mention, he's probably had to listen all week to people saying, you know, and he probably doesn't pay heed and he probably doesn't read it himself online or whatever. But, you know, when you're in that public sphere, there's no getting away from hearing the thoughts of others. And if he has to listen to that negativity all week, he's suddenly losing in France. He's been pulled off the pitch. He is only human at the end of the day, you know. So yeah. um, in terms of his reaction, I think probably the public's reaction was more overboard than his own. Um but in terms of your second question, then in terms of replacing Sexton and what does Farrell have to do? Yeah. I think, I think that over the next couple of, well, competitions, yeah, Farrell gives time to other players, but I don't think it's up to Farrell to replace Sexton. I think it's up to the provinces to make sure that they're developing players by playing them in the in Europe in the best competitions. Um, like when you look at the Irish squad... They to put up their hand effectively. Well, more or less. I mean, like, fellas want to do that. And when you mm. bring in young players, like, let's say Craig, let's take Craig Casey just for brass tacks. Craig Casey came into the Ireland squad and he saw how it's done. He sees what's expected of him. But he has to look at that and say to himself, I can exceed those expectations and I can do better than that. Mm -hmm. And I think the likes of Ross Byrne, Harry Byrne, Jack Carty, Billy Burns, whoever's brought in, as let's say for this weekend, they'd be the understudy because Sexton's starting. 
when they're brought into that environment, they have to exceed the expectations of the coach. Mm. And the Irish squad, it's a collection of the best players in Ireland. It's not a training camp. It's not an academy system. It is essentially you are all the best players in your position at the moment. You're going to come into this. Now, like how often does Farrell see those guys during the year? Yeah, he can have discussions with them when they're not in camp and all that. But at the end of the day, the Irish squad, it's a collection of the best players in the country. So for that 10 role to develop or for someone to take over that 10 role, well, you know, there is an onus on the provinces as well, but it's certainly a big onus on the the players to make sure that they're chomping at the bit and driving that competition too. I think if you depend on a coach to instill a sense of, I suppose, if you if you depend on the coach to instill that sense of expectation rather than the player, you're going to have a very short, pro- short, short um, lifespan product, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and like, to be fair to him, I, I think it's definitely right uh, to give Billy Burns a run out. Be to see how much game time he gets and how much he does with that opportunity. I'm really looking forward to uh, the Autumn Nations. More so now, I, I really appreciate your insight. Uh, it contrasts certainly with my own because I'm flighty. I, I'm reactionary. You're certainly an awful lot more measured. But I'm that's very boring. The beauty yeah, of I'm having you on. Um, <laughs> well, you have your chance to shine because coming up next is how well you know your sport quiz. We'll see how measured you are for that. Brilliant. So, how well do you know your sport, Jeff Neville of the Loose Head uh, Podcast? We are found, soon about to find out. So, five questions, one minute. They're all multiple choice. And the time starts now. Number one, what was the final score of Ireland's Grand Slam winning match against Wales in 2009? Was it A, 14-16, B, 15-17, or C, 16-18? We scored a try. So I think, was it B, 15, 17? It was indeed. Number two, Rory Best retired after the 2019 World Cup. How many international caps did he have? Was it A, 111, B, 124, or C, 117? 117. Oh, 124. Was it? Okay. Moving on to number three. In what year did Ireland famously host England in Crow Park for the first time? Was it 2006, 2007, or 2008? 2006. It was 2006. Oh, 2007. So unlucky, because we beat England in Twickenham the year before 2006. Anyways, I'm digressing. Number four. With 557 points, who has scored the most points in Guinness Six Nations history? Is it A, Johnny Wilkinson, B, Ron Nogara, or C, Stephen Jones? I'm going to have to go for uh, Raj on this one. Good man. That got you back on track. Two for two. Two for four, rather. Um, <laughs> two for four. <laughs> right. Uh, finally, who has the most ball carries in a single Six Nations encounter with 30 carries? Is it A, Dennis Leamy, B, CJ Stander, or C, David Wallace? I know CJ had a lot there in a, in a game not so long ago. Uh, I, go, I go with CJ. Dennis Leamy has it. Typical Leamy. Typical. I'm telling you, man, you see, it, like the, the pressure gets you. This is how well you know your sport and this is why you test your knowledge. Two for five. Unreal. Best score <laughs> of the day. So what I'd, I'd like to do before I just leave you is we ask all of our guests to choose your Irish sporting legend. Now, this isn't a multiple choice one. This is literally just your opinion. We're going to r- roll you a clip. There's eight Irish sporting legends. You can't get it wrong. So you can choose your best. <laughs> okay. He's out. The heat, my old dress goal. Oh, brilliant by dress goal. It's Roy Keane. Roy Keane with a captain's goal. And up to move Rocket. Rocket from Sheffield. Rory, you know the storylines and the stakes for him. A win not just means the Masters, but it means the Grand Slam. And that's beautiful. 
and Sonny O'Sullivan is going to take the world title. Block up to Dublin's captain, Stephen Truxton. The rising pride of Ireland, Katie So my pick out of those nine, is it? Mm-hmm. Um, I think until the last one, I was probably going to go with uh, Henry Shefflin, but it has to be Katie Taylor, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, it has to be Katie Good Taylor. Good man. Katie Taylor is absolutely romping home in this, by the way. Oh, I'd imagine so. She's Ireland. Like, in my eyes, she'd be Ireland's greatest ever sports star. Um, yeah. I think, to be honest with you. And uh, it's no surprise that she's probably running away with it, like. Yeah, we had um, Kevin McStay went for Cluxton. Uh, someone went for Keane. And uh, uh, someone went for someone else. But yeah, Katie Taylor has been everyone's favourite because of her contribution to her sport has been just monumental. Oh, As is your contribution to this show. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to let you go right now. But thanks a million. Enjoy the Autumn Nations Cup. And uh, if anyone wants to check out the Loosehead podcast before, before I let you go, how, how can they do so? Oh, they can find it on Twitter or um, they can find it on Instagram, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the usual, I suppose. Anywhere at all. all right. Perfect. Jeff, thanks a million for joining me. Really appreciate your time. Take it easy, man. Be good. No, no, that's the love.